and welcome to a new episode of Coast to Coast Connections this time. We're actually going to be heading up to the Arctic Circle for the world's toughest foot race. But before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that we're coming to you from the Sinemuk uh, traditional territory here in Nanaimo on Vancouver Island. And we're grateful to live and work in this area. And now we're heading up north uh, to the top of the world. Check out this amazing race. Now picture in your mind, who would the individual look like that actually uh, would win a race like this? You won't have to wait much further. We have the winner with us today, no other than young Rio Crystal. Welcome, Rio. <laughs> Thank you. And congratulations, Rio. And please tell us how old you are and where you're from. <laughs> I am 18 years old and I'm from the Kumox Valley here on Vancouver Island in Canada. And Rio, congratulations to you. You're the not only the youngest person to finish the race, you're the only Canadian to ever have finished it. And tell the viewers what your record time was. I think this race is supposed to span seven days, but what was your time? My time was four days, 15 hours and 11 minutes. That's incredible. And this 6633 Ultra Arctic race has been going on since 2003. And there's various categories of the race. But in all, almost 20 years now, there's only been 37 people who've actually completed the race. Um, and yours, I know, is a sort of slightly different category this year. But you are in a very elite group, Rio. Yeah, <laughs> I, I wouldn't deny that. So, Rio, what inspired you to do this race? Um, Tell us how this began. In grade 11, I watched a video promoting a man named Anders Hoffman doing the first Ironman on Antarctica. And I saw him, he did complete it. And I saw that and I was like, dang, I could do that. But it did cost him $200,000 USD. And unless you're like the Saudi prince, no 18 year old can afford that. So I, I was like, I'm going to look up the next best thing, which is the toughest ultra marathon in the world. And that did cost $10,000. But thankfully, I worked over the last four years so I could afford that, uh, even without sponsors. Wow. And uh, 10,000 US dollars? Uh, 10,000 Canadian for this one. 10,000 Canadian. And yeah. what type of work were you doing as a young man to um, save for this race? Uh, I did a paper route and then a bit of soccer refereeing. And then for the last three, four years, I've been in the restaurant industry. Good for you. And that's all during COVID as well. So thank you for yes. being out there on the front line for us as well. Um, now, Rio, tell us, how do you prepare in lovely Comox, BC, Canada, one of the nicest climates in, in, on the West Coast here? Um, how do you prepare for a race that's going to take you to minus 40 degrees uh, centigrade? <laughs> 
that's incredible conditions and the winds and uh, the solitude. We'll talk about all of that today. But tell us about the, the, how did you prepare your body physically for this, for those types of temperatures? Physically, I did a lot of running and a lot of walking. So it'd be like interval training, 800 meters down a trail and then 1,000 meters back up, 800 meters run, 1,000 walking. So that way I get a lot of the running and walking in. Right. So each week I was doing, I progressively overloaded. So at the end of summer, I was probably doing 30K a week just because I had a few foot issues. And then in November, I was up to 70. And by December, I was doing 100. And by the time I left Comox, I was doing 120. But in December, I did fly to Edmonton. And I spent a week training there, did four back-to-back 50-kilometer -back days. Wow. And that was negative 25 on the coldest. I think the warmest was like negative 10 or something. So it's pretty much what you would get in the Arctic. Right. So that was, a, that was a good physical test. And then I went up to Whitehorse a month in advance to the race just to get really acclimatized and used to the cold and test all my gear in case right. things don't work out. Exactly. And uh, how did you test your equipment here and in Edmonton as well? Uh, were you running with, you know, your like full gear on your parkas? Were you sleeping in your sleeping bag outside, that type of thing? Were you in the back of a refrigerated truck? I, I can't afford a refrigerated truck like Anders can, but uh, I didn't test much of my gear over here. I just, it's too warm and it's too wet and it's, it's a completely different environment. So I tested all of it. I still had a month and I figured anything I need, I could always buy up there because they have very good clothing and equipment up there as well at Coast Mountain Sports. The race itself went from Dawson City, um, Yukon to the Arctic Circle. So it took place entirely in the Yukon and we've got a couple of maps of that. And it also shows the various checkpoints along the way, Rio. Uh, mm. there was, how often were you checked at these checkpoints and what happened? I was fast, so I get probably at least two checkpoints a day, one in the morning and one in the evening, or one at midday, and then the next one will be at some ungodly hour in the morning. But um, at the checkpoints, I would receive hot water, and I carried five liters of hot water, so I would get five liters of hot water, and I, I would eat my breakfast there, or lunch, or your sleep set schedule is messed up and so is your eating schedule. So you just eat when you're hungry. Mm. So I figured I'll just eat at the checkpoints and on the road and also got the medical treatment. So a bit DP and taping when required and absolutely was required. Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I understand that a lot of people have to drop out because of frostbite um, or other injuries as well. Rio. Mm -hmm. Did you suffer any uh, frostbite at all to any of your extremities? I had a little worry and I went to the doctor's office yesterday and turns out it's just a bunch of nerve damage, oh, wow. uh, which which will solve itself. But because of all the, the pressure on your feet through five days, right? Right. Mm -hmm. That's well, that's good news. I'm really glad to hear that because I think last year, one of the competitors um, and these competitors come from all over the world, don't they, Rio? Mm -hmm. From over Denmark and Europe and even Zimbabwe, Australia. This is a very, very popular race. And one of them, I think, had to be uh, flown out last year because of severe frostbite to his feet and to his hands. And I think he, under mm -hmm. he actually lost those uh, his feet and hands as a result of this. So this race is very dangerous as well. So, Rio, a lot of the time you're um, in a lot of solitude on this race. How did you prepare yourself for that? And just before we do that, I just want to show the viewers this sh very short clip. It shows you coming in from the distance with your headlamp on and just it gives us a sense of the solitude. We'll just listen to that for a second. And there's something that you're shouting at the end of that clip. It's like, 
Saluk or something. What was that? <laughs> yes. I was yelling, let's go, because I, ju- I was just arriving at the finish line there. Oh, and, okay. uh, that's just turning into the finish line. You can see, you'll see one of the, the clips later on. But, um, okay. Yeah, I was like, oh, let's go. We finally did it. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Mm-hmm. So how, how was the mental <clears throat> preparation for this? Grueling, right? How do you how do you do that? Um it's very it's very hard to describe. You have to experience it to truly understand it. But the whole the whole journey is pretty lonely. Um I was probably up every other night up to like 3 a.m. just couldn't fall asleep, just thinking about a whole life, right? So mm-hmm. it is it is a lonely process and because especially at my age, there are very few people who are working so hard on a goal, yes. let alone the world's toughest ultra marathon. And it's very hard to want to be around other people when they aren't putting that much effort into themselves. Mm-hmm. And uh, my victory speech, I, I did mention this in the last six months, I've probably hung out with more millionaires than people my age because I was so focused on adding value to my life. And there's very few people my age who are working so hard on something who have so much knowledge about something that they can really teach me. That's it's remarkable. You're you're an old soul, my friend, to be able to do this at such a young age. <laughs> now, did you have any hallucinations along the way? Being by yourself that and under those conditions can be very mentally draining. There was a, a film being made, a Romanian film about hallucinations being made, and I was the only one on the race who didn't get hallucinations. Mm. Now, people saw their their parents waving at them, their their deceased family members, their best friends, their former wives in the Aurora Borealis dancing, waving at them. But I was, I was so focused on wondering where the heck second place was that my mind was always focused on the race and getting one foot in front of the other that I didn't really have time for hallucinations. <laughs> Talk to us a little bit more about the Aurora Borealis. We've got a very short clip here that we're going to show viewers, and I just think it speaks to um, the type of person you are. You make some lovely remarks here. I'm like sort of like the auroras now, but I want to be able to become like the sunset because you can watch the sunset anywhere in the world and with anyone, and anyone can join you with, during the sunset. So I think auroras are like independence, but sunset is like shared love and unconditional love with everyone. Talk to us, Rio, okay. about uh, the difference between the sunset and the aurora borealis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sure, we'll, we'll cut this part out. <laughs> <coughs> um, <coughs> I still have cold lungs, Chief. <coughs> um, one of the days, uh, I was mic'd up and every third word was a curse word, so we won't play the audio. But, uh, it was 2 a.m. in the morning and I was just walking out and I saw auroras for the first time, right? These amazing auroras, they're just dancing right above you. And, oh, it was so beautiful. But it was also super lonely. I was the only person in a 50K radius wow. and there's no city near me. It's all mountains and it's it's negative 36 out. It was very cool. So it was, it was beautiful, but it was also kind of sad at the same time. Yeah. And then the next, probably two days later, I think, I saw the best sunset of my life. Like, picture this the sun's behind you. You can see it perfectly circular. And then the snow is reflecting all the golden sun rays. Mm-hmm. And then you know how you can see rain in the distance and it looks like a, uh, a little curtain a rain curtain in the distance right now that was snow so it was like a whole white curtain around you except since it's sunset you had a whole purple and pink curtain around you and you're walking on gold in that moment i i questioned myself would i rather only see sunsets for the rest of my life or the aurora borealis and i'm not sure about adults but my it's pretty much every sunset i've experienced i've been with people I care about, my best friends or my family members, right? And experiencing the auroras all by myself was kind of lonely. And I was like, wow, that's kind of like me. In the last six months, I've only been focused on myself. And I've been very picky with the people that 
I put myself around, the people I choose to hang out with. And, you know, the Aurora, as I said, it's, it's polar, there's very few people around it, and it's, it's extravagant, don't get me wrong. But it costs a lot of money to see, and now it's lonely. And I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's me. But a sunset, it's, you can see anywhere in the world, where, whether you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter if you're in the Arctic or if you're in Chile. You can see it anywhere. And for me, I've, all the sunsets I've seen have been with people that I care about. And I was like, wow, this is like unconditional love. It doesn't matter if they add value to my life or not. They love me no matter what. And I've, I've through the journey, I've been able to become a person that I really love, although a little bit lonely. But I'm a person that I'm proud to be. But now I need to work on being able to, to share the love that I have for myself with the people around me. And that's sort of like the sunset. Rio, that's beautiful. That's very um, poetic and um, way beyond your years as well. And trust me, there's a lot of people who are proud of you. And I'm sure your parents uh, must just be thrilled about this. The fact that you not only did it, but that you got it back safely. What did their support mean to you during this time? It, oh, it meant absolutely everything. Like, I didn't realize how much support I had until I did. A, oh, I forgot to mention earlier. I did practice ultra marathon in White Horse as well. So two back to back 80 kilometer days. And on the first day, I went up about 2000 meters, a little under 2000 meters in elevation across 40 kilometers. Wow. That's steep. And oh, it was, yeah, it's steep. And uh, near the top of the biathlon range. And I was like, wow, I hope one of these bullets just hits me in the head because this thing sucks. And in that moment, I was like, no, I can't die. You know, it's like suicide doesn't stop the pain. You're only moving it. And, mm -hmm. you know, my mom would be devastated. My parents, like everyone would be devastated. And that moment was like, oh, no, I'm completing this thing for sure. And that was a wall I hit. That was the only wall I hit during the whole whole journey that, that really pushed me through. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of grit and determination. And uh, as I say, I'm sure they're very, very, very proud of you. Rio, how do you uh, sustain yourself? Like, what are you eating during this time? And how do you stay hydrated? So as I mentioned, we get five liters of hot water at the checkpoints. So I get, what well, it's a hydro flask and it's vacuum sealed or heat sealed or something like that. So it doesn't get cold really. And also had a, uh, a camel back, okay. which is it's something that you have on your back usually when you're hiking and the straw comes over, right? Although that isn't, that will get, if you leave it outside, it'll, it'll freeze in five minutes or something. Wow. So what I did was I put hot water in that and I put that inside my sleeping bag. And a sleeping bag reflects the heat of what's inside, right? So if you have 40 degrees inside the sleeping bag, the sleeping bag will be 40 degrees. Mm -hmm. If you have something that's two degrees inside the sleeping bag, the sleeping bag will be two degrees. So I put my my camel back, which uh, radiates hot heat. I put that inside my sleeping bag and I had two other thermists that I wouldn't have to put in the sleeping bag. And I got, that was my five liters of water and I have my food here. Breakfast was just oats, freeze dried, uh, with milk and fruits and in a freeze dryer you don't lose any of the the calories You're probably okay. a bit of the vitamins but you don't lose any calories so with this you just add hot water and it's good to go uh, here's my dinners it's rice beef salsa cheese beans uh, a few other things as well not that don't really matter spices mm -hmm probably about a thousand calories as well um keeps you going i only ate this once because i threw up the one time i ate it and i figured you know what i threw up once i'm not gonna risk again i have like 15 bags of oatmeal i'll just eat oatmeal because my stomach seems to appreciate that more and my lunches i think my cat scratched it so air got into it so before it's super vacuum sealed, I can smell the food and I don't really want to smell the food because it brings me back to bad memories of being so exhausted. But it's all, all freeze dried as well. Wow. Vegetables, fruits, um, 
So there's peppers, apples, pears, bananas, two granola bars, uh, two packs of seaweed, uh, two different type of beef jerky, and chocolate covered acai berries. So that was about 1,800 calories, I believe. Oh, and cheese. So, and you're, yeah. you're usually eating by yourself, right, on the trail. It's not like you're all meeting up um, at, at a camp. No, no. You're, you're sleeping by yourself too, aren't you? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. sure you're in your sleeping bag as well, in your um, bivy, I think they call it. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the sled that you're pulling, how much did that weigh with all your gear on it? I didn't measure because it, yeah. it felt light enough. I did 80, I did two back-to-back -back 80K days, but I assume mm -hmm. probably about... The sled itself probably weighs 30 pounds mm -hmm. and the the gear is probably about the same, maybe a little less. So I'll, I'll go with about roughly 50 pounds. That's a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was one thing that you wish you would have taken with you, Rio? That if you had to do it again, you'd make sure you would bring together with you one thing. Better food. Okay. Yeah. I I wouldn't change anything just because it turned out perfectly, right? Oh, maybe oh. maybe different uh, uh, different water because on one of the night, a uh, different water system. One of the nights, my everything freezes and it breaks, right? The yes. the top part of my Camelback broke off, and I had three liters of water draining into my my sleeping bag. Oh. And it's a down sleeping bag, so that's a big problem. But fortunately, out of dumb luck, I put my I put it inside my busy bag, which was inside my sleeping bag. That was the only one time I did during the race. So fortunately, my sleeping bag didn't get wet. My busy bag was a, sh a shelf of ice. But, um, that didn't really bother me as long as my sleeping bag was dry. And uh, fortunately, that night was only negative 25 degrees, which it sounds cold, but it's very doable if you have the right equipment. Oh. Mm -hmm. That was really, really, really good luck. Um, mm -hmm. Did you see any wildlife out there? I'm wearing my polar bear earrings for you, for you today, but <laughs> <don't> <laughs> from that quite far south, or maybe with global warming, they do. But any wildlife sightings? Uh, one fox, a few ptarmigans, and all the crazy, crazy guys on the race. <laughs> and this took place in February, right? This this race. Uh, uh, end of February 26th to. March, March 5th was the end. And mm -hmm. again, seven days to complete. So how many started with you, Rio, and how many uh, finished this one? So there was originally 36 people that signed up for the race. Um, but because of COVID measures at the time, they could come to Canada, but they wouldn't be able to get back into the country, whether it was Southeast Asia, South Africa, or Australia, right. especially the Aussies, right? They'd have a really tough time. Right. So because of that, I went from 36 down to 10. Wow. But I think they, they're all 10 were super competitive people that really want to win the race or not win, but participate in it. And every one of them has completed the Marathon de Sable, which is in the Saharas, which used to be known as the toughest race in the world. But now it's more of a, a tourist attraction for ultra marathoners. It's something on everyone's bucket list. So everyone's super experienced. Uh, there's 10 people who all entered the 250 mile race and they were given the option to pull out at 120 miles and they would still get a winner's medal. Nice. Just because there's uh, so little people this year, it was less maintenance. It wasn't like the, the 20 or 30 people usually. So there was 10 people at the beginning and five people finished the 250 mile race and two people finished the 120 mile race. Wow. Mm -hmm. And we've got a, a nice clip here, Rio, of you actually coming into the finish line. And we'll just let viewers take a look at this. Come on, bud. I love you. Crazy 
one video, man. One video can change your life. One 20 minute video. You have to see it later. Yes, theory. Anders Hoffman, he did the first. Alright, man, I had Tractica. And uh, in a couple years' time, I'll be interested. I'll tell you that. Woo! Congratulations! Well done, mate. And Rio, um, I think you have it there. Show us your Anukshuk trophy that you won. There wasn't any prize money involved, right? It was it was all for nope. this uh, <laughs> Anukshuk. <laughs> the money is absolutely worth it, though. All the, well, the money that's spent, ten thousand dollars, the amount of knowledge you gain and stuff that you learn about this yourself, and especially at my age, all the doors I've opened for myself are absolutely worth it. Yeah, and one of the photos we have, you're standing in front of a. a, a frozen area with looks like a pool of water. Was that a dunk tank for the end of the race? <laughs> yes, after the race, I yeah went there. I, I needed a picture with my trophy, right? And yeah. I thought no no better place to take it. And uh, yeah, me and a, f a few people from the race, uh, we just went for a quick little dip. Nice, very mm -hmm. good. Uh, Rio, what's next for you after this amazing accomplishment? Um, where do you go from here? What's next on your, your list of things to do? Well, with ultra marathons, it can't get any tougher. No. So, <laughs> would you do this again? Would you do this again? I would. I'll absolutely do it again. I'll come back and I want to. I'll say the things I want to accomplish first. So, there's a bunch of mountains I like to climb: Kilimanjaro, um, and then Mount Logan. My middle name is Elias, which is pretty ironic. And Elias is uh, Mount Saint Elias is the second tallest mountain in Canada, and the Saint Elias Range is the tallest mountain range in Canada. So Mount Logan is the tallest mountain in Canada. So that's a lot of in Canada right there. But Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Logan, and hopefully youngest Canadian to climb Everest as well. Wow. So and that'll, yeah. be all, that'll be all within the next five years. Wow, Rio. You are very ambitious, ambitious and determined. It's, it's super impressive. And your last name being Crystal is very appropriate because just in chatting with you now, there are so many facets to your personality and character that I think your, your last name totally suits you. And I, I know that you're going to achieve a lot of those other accomplishments that you have. Yeah. Um, any other uh, closing thoughts or words of inspiration for anybody who wants to uh, take this on themselves? What, what do you say? Oh, you got, you got to get rid of motivation. Motivation is an absolute no-no when it comes to a huge goal you chase because the whole time I was probably burnt out and I would say the toughest part of the whole training was putting my shoes on. And it took me two hours. I was like, oh, I got to go run. Oh, I need to eat this. I need to go to the bathroom. I need to drink a lot of water. And all this thought process, it's a bunch of procrastination and time wasted. Mm -hmm. um, and that's if you're motivated. But if you're, you're disciplined, you're like, you know what, love it or hate it, I need to go do this, I'm going to chase this goal, because at the end, it's absolutely worth it. And motivation is, I say, the willingness to do something because of how you feel, and discipline is to do something despite of how you feel. Thank you, Rio. You're quite the young philosopher as well. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing this story with us today, Rio. And we just say congratulations again from all of us here in Canada. That's an amazing achievement, young man. And we really look forward to other adventures and having you back uh, for other episodes as you achieve some of these goals. So thank you so much for joining us today, Rio. And all the I best you of health and happiness. And thank you for joining us today for this episode of Coast to Coast Connections. And uh, hope this has inspired you also to reach beyond your limits and see just what you have inside that uh, might surprise you. Thank you so much for watching. If you're watching on YouTube, please do subscribe to our uh, videos. Uh, we put them out about once or twice a month. I'm Elizabeth Hines. I've been with Rio Crystal here on this interview. Thanks for joining us today. Bye-bye for now. Bye.